So hello everyone, my name is Amy Fitzpatrick and I'm the Director of Marketing for IEVM and I just want to thank everyone who's attending today for our October E3 for the IEVM Foundation and today we're very lucky to have three amazing ladies to talk to us on their experiences professionally as being black and a woman in America and in our industry. And before we get started though, I would like to open the mic up to Miss Gina, our current interim foundation director so that she can welcome everyone as well and then turn it over to our panel for the day. Miss Gina. Yes, I'd like to welcome everyone as well on behalf of the foundation. And uh, we're so excited about today's topic. And we want to thank the members too that are taking time away from your, your busy day to participate and listen and see what we all can learn. So thank you so much. And I will go ahead and turn it over to our uh, host right now. Thank you, everyone. Okay, ladies. Um, my name is Ebony Haddix. I am uh, the Senior Manager of Box Office Operations for the Memphis Grizzlies. Uh, I currently serve as the Chair of the DILC Committee for IABM. Um, I'm also a member of Intix. Um, I am from the South. I am actually from Mississippi, working in Memphis. Um, I was raised by a um, both of my parents as a Baptist, Southern, traditional <laughs> person in the South. So um, on that note, I'm gonna let one of my co-hosts uh, introduce themselves. Let me, let me go, I'll go, I'll go. Um, I'm Sharon Washington, owner of the P3 Solution. I am a marketing and communication strategist for about 22 years. Um, I am from the East Coast, born and raised in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, proud um, public school attendee all my life from primary school through high school, um, even college. So I went to school in D.C. and was fortunate enough to speak and travel the world. I am a new IAVM member, but um, I feel like I'm family because I've been speaking on your circuit for several years. So um, I'm glad to be here and excited to talk about my experience. Hi, everyone. My name is Cynthia Tucker, and I'm the Assistant Director of Trojan Event Services at the University of Southern California. I'm also an adjunct professor teaching a venue management course at USC. And I'm uh, the vice chair of the Diversity and Inclusive Leadership Committee with Ebony. I've had the pleasure um, to be on the committee for two years and now sitting as the vice chair. I'm also on the university's committee, on the academics committee. Um, I've had a mentor through IAVM. Um, I've been a mentee. And so just really excited to be here. I am born and raised in Los Angeles. I'm actually a third generation Californian. Um, my family history is my great, 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 great grandfather came here during the gold rush and um, went and, and our family settled here and the, the laughing joke of our family, we're still looking for the pot of gold that is buried somewhere here in California. Um, but I am proud to be a native California um, and went to school here also UC Santa Barbara as well as Pepperdine. So welcome everyone. Yes, welcome to our conversations. Um, how should we start, ladies? All right. Well, just to let everyone know, this is not structured like a moderator or a panelist. It's kind of, we're going to steal the idea of kind of Jada Pinkett's Red Table Talk. So what you're about to experience is just having three Black women that would be sitting around talking about what it means to be a Black, to be a woman in the industry, be it venue management or in corporate America. So. Uh, it's going to be flowing. It's going to be humorous. Um, maybe shed a tear or two, right. um, but that's how it's going to flow today. And if you have any questions, <laughs> please go ahead and add those to the chat or to the Q and A, and we will get to those. Um, but let's let's kick let's kick it off and talk a little bit about explicit bias. Right. Um. Uh, I, so where do we begin? Right. Um, I would, we, you know, we've had these conversations about um, what that looks like, and I teach, I'm, a, I'm also an adjunct professor at Trinity University. I've been teaching communication for about 15 years, 
and um, with my experience, and I like to teach the students with theory through practice, because as we know, many of us, what you learn, whether it's grade school or college, sometimes doesn't translate in real life. So I try to make sure that when I talk about things that I can bring up real life situations so that they can have um, some hacks, some tactics on how to deal with it. And so one thing I talk about specifically is talking about bias. And people are so afraid. If you ask them, what kind of biases do you have? Or do you think you have a bias? The first thing they will say is no, because the connotation of bias always seems to be negative. But in reality, we only kind of have a vantage point. We're living through our own experiences in that itself itself is a bias. So um, what I try to do, especially as a, a Black woman, um, and I still have to say young Black woman, I'm, going, I'm holding on to that. I'm holding on to that. Um, as a young Black woman, in an industry, I deal in multiple industries. I've gone and spoken in places where I've been the only person of color. I've been the only woman person of color and had to go um, put myself out there. I try to manage my own biases and stereotypes and kind of go in and show up authentically and integrity, in, with integrity. Mm -hmm. Anybody else experience? Ebony, what do you, have you ever experienced? I'm sure you have, being the only one. What does that feel like for us? being the only one in a room? So I, for me, especially being from the South, um, you're often the only one in the room. And I've experienced this from the time that I was in elementary school, kindergarten, um, up until, you know, even now, there's occasionally times where I walk into the room and I'm the only one. And you're kind of taken aback because everybody walks into the room and you're, you're scanning for somebody. You know, um, you're also scanning for smiles, but you're, you're scanning for someone to give you that comfort, that relief that you have, you're able to breathe in a room. And when you look around and you see no one like you, um, there is a sense of uh, your heart kind of just clenches <laughs> and you're like, okay, take a deep breath. You've got this. You, you're almost mentally coaching yourself to, to go into the room and find a friendly face. Yeah. Cynthia. And, and, you know, as for me, uh, I also used to being the only one, it's, it's actually surprising when I'm not. And mm -hmm. we should be at a point where I should not be shocked when I am the only one or looking to see when there is um, someone else, be it another woman or another person of, of African American or black descent. But I went to predominantly white schools pretty much all of my life. Um, from elementary school to junior high school. And I remember having a conversation with my mom and uh, again, being born and raised right here in Los Angeles. I said, mom, I want to go to school where I'm not the minority. I'm tired of being the only one in my class or the only one of two. I really want to go to the local high school right down the street, which uh, was probably not the best high school in the area at that time. And she said, are you sure that's what you want to do? <laughs> And I said, I just want to be around other people that just, that don't question my hazel eyes or don't question the fairness of my skin and ask right. me when your parents are white. I just want to be a part of the crowd. And I then went to a predominantly black and Latino high school and loved it. Then went to UC Santa Barbara. So I think that having that growing up in, in elementary and junior high school and then going to college has prepared me to where I am now, um, being, um, I lead a department where I'm the only African-American um, in my department, mm -hmm. one of two women in my department. Um, but definitely with, with diversity, we wanna see more, but um, it, doesn't, it doesn't surprise me. Um, but when I do step in the room and I'm the only one, I do feel that I'm representing also for those that I wanna pave the way that I don't want this to happen within the next couple of years. I want someone else, I want to pave the way so that I can bring in more people um, for that, so that experience doesn't continue to happen. Cynthia, I'm glad you brought that up because this question came to mind for me because this happens to me. So having to make the switch to going to um, um, the local high school, right? 
that with your now your friends have changed to more people who you resonate with or you feel like you have an experience with because of the color. Um, what happened? So for me, when I go around these same friends, many of them didn't didn't have or didn't take the opportunities that I take. So now I still even stick out in that room of people because I have degrees, I'm on business, you know, I travel the world doing the things that I love and not many, I, I have to say this and be honest, not many of my school childhood friends had this opportunity. It's a small number of us. And so when I go back to reunions, reunions, I still feel like the same. Well, I told you my nickname is Smiley, right? For all you attendees, my nickname is Smiley. I was a cheerleader. And I, I'm, I feel like I'm still Smiley, but there is a, a separate and a difference when I get um, around them for reunions and things like that. There are, I am the success story. So then I, there's bias there where I feel like I'm the only sometimes. You're, you are absolutely right. I remember, so when I was in high school, I was part of the academic decathlon, student body vice president, held high leadership positions. But I remember the first thing that they would always tell me is, why do you sound like a white girl? Right. And, and then fast forward to my, I think it was my 10 or 15, my 10 year class reunion, my background, in addition to venue management, is event planning. That's actually what I studied and I did for, for almost 20, 25 years, event planning. So, of course, I was on the committee to join, to put together our, our class reunion, and our registration was really low. And someone found out that the people that were planning the reunion were the nerds. <laughs> And that's why they didn't want to attend because they said, that's not going to be fun. It's being, mm. nerds. it's being planned by our student body president. She was a nerd then, and I'm sure she's still a nerd now. And so <laughs> even though I went to a predominantly black high school, I was still that top, that small percentage of us that I did not relate to or, or, or have friends among everyone that we were called the talented 10th which is very similar to you know, Booker T. Washington, where we represented 10% of our graduating class. We were all college bound. We were all um, uh, focused on leadership positions, et cetera. So yeah, and the 20 year reunion, I said, forget it, I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> and see for me, mine, like I said, um, out of my class, I went to a small uh, rural public school yeah. and out of a class of 48, um, people, three black people. So <laughs> um, I, I've told you guys this story and I will share with everyone else. I was the youngest of our class. Um, one of the things that I went through, um, when you get to like, I think it was the first grade or so, um, they test you to see if you're able to be in a gifted class. And I remember you go for the summer and uh, my dad took me. Um, I come from my parents were, worked in factories, but over the summer, my dad took a day off and took me to school. And I sat in a classroom with a teacher who um, also did not look like me um, and went through these questions and these tests. And somehow my dad found out um, I was not gifted according to these standards by a point. And so that bothered me. But one of the things that my dad told me was that though that they set this bar, it's not where you have to stay. Um, he told me, you know, you're, nobody looks like you. Uh, there's a few people that look like you, but not all. But you don't have to stay where they think you are because there were no uh, gifted black people in, at the class. If, if I wasn't in it um, or Lee or Cassandra, they weren't in it. So nobody would, it was no one of color um, in that. However, because my dad encouraged me to keep going and to say, you know, just because you're the only in the room does not mean you're, you don't deserve to be there. He, he set that bar for me and um, being the youngest, being one of three uh, black people, I went on to be the valedictorian in my class um, where, you know, I, I, I was that person who was one, I was the extrovert. Um, if they needed somebody to do something, I said, I'll do it. Um, if you'll teach me how, 
and how people, the, the best thing is when you have people who see the potential in you, um, whether black, white, green, when they mean for someone to do well, they do push you to go further than even you want to go. Um, I think back to another teacher. Her name was uh, Lorraine Ballard. She was a tall, skinny white woman um, with the sweetest demeanor. Um, she, she played piano. I always wanted to play piano for some reason, but um, she was our business teacher and she taught me how to carry myself. She taught me how to, um, to do business letters, how to speak um, in rooms where I was the only one, because here's the thing, she was a woman and she knew how it was to be in business as a woman. And one of the things that we, we go into these rooms and a lot of us, if you were in your career position before, um, I'm gonna say 15 years ago, or you were starting work, a lot of times you walked into the room and you were the only woman in, in a lot of these rooms and in these meetings. And when you walk in, they're, they're like, okay, are you bringing the coffee? No, I'm here to pitch an idea. Yeah. So. Do you all see these questions? These yes, are some yes. very <laughs> good questions. Like these are some very good we're questions. We're tackle them now. We, yeah. we, we, we set out a whole agenda because we're all, you know, <laughs> organizers and planners. We love the questions. Please, please keep coming. Please keep, yeah, please keep coming. But I want to piggyback a little bit off of what you said, Ebony. Talking about mentorship, the keyword now is sponsorship. Um, one of the questions was was talking about uh, what someone was asking, uh, have you ever had someone else or shadowed someone else or anything like that? Have any of you ladies had an experience, um, and I know I have, where you've had someone that sponsored you? And the difference between a mentor and a sponsor, just so people know, is that mentor is someone that just kind of gives you some advice. That sponsor, from what I know, is that person who really advocates for you. It's that, that might be in your company that's above you in position that says there's an opening I know Cynthia would do great for it or Sharon would be great for it Ebony would great and really really vouches for you do you have um sponsors or have had sponsors in any of your positions or, or, or companies uh at the top of my career or the beginning of my career um no though the it was not available to me what the things that I wanted wanted to do build a business um I, I think outside the box cre more creatively I don't like to follow the flow um if any if it makes any difference I'm a Leo <laughs> um, so um, I'm super ambitious about what I want to do so no so I built my own group of women that I vetted that we become sponsors for one another um, I do have a mentor. Her name is Karima Mariama Arthur, and she's in leadership and she's an attorney. And she has been more of a big sister, you know, someone I can lean on. And in my group and with my mentor, what I've mentor, I've learned that um, you have to refer people. Like people need to help people. So in this group, it is required. Required that you help one another so i am lucky to say in the last decade that i have many sponsors um and i'm probably sponsors to many others because i believe in giving back or paying it forward and not just paying it forward because it's a good thing to do to pay it forward but if i know that you're good at this and people need even if we're in the same industry even if we're in the same position even if we do the same thing if I'm unavailable and I know that someone else is, is good at doing that, I'm, I'm absolutely going to refer them. But that, that only happened in the last decade, if that, seven to 10 years. Yeah. And I definitely, through the years, have had mentors and sponsors um, that all keep an eye out on me. And I say, I still have them to, to this day. I mean, people are like, hey, Ebony, have you thought about going in this direction? And I'm like, hmm, let me sit and think about that. So um, definitely something that we all need. Um, and one of the things about being part of like the 100 women, um, 100 plus women, or being part of any organization is you find a group of people who can be that for you. Um, and it's, it's good that, as you can see, we have three black women on the panel but we don't all have the exact same experience. 
So what Cynthia brings to help me and what Sharon brings to help me, it all comes into my, my per perception pot and then I can mix and I can see different ways about being a person. Um, mentorship, one of the most important things that you can find. I, I love that um, Michelle Obama has a podcast and she talks about mentorship and she talks with uh, Valerie Jarrett, which was someone who, um, when she was applying for a job outside of her law firm into um, public, um, the public arena, she met Valerie Jaron, and through that relationship, she found ways to be a better woman um, in the workplace, to be a better mother in the workplace. Um, so we as women have this layer to us that we're always looking for comfort on how we, how we are perceived in the workplace. Uh, for example, Miss uh, Valerie, she, if her daughter called, she was always to be, you know, told that she was on the phone and that she was available for her daughter at all times. And that gave Michelle Obama the, you know, mindset to be like, when my daughters call, I want to be there for them too. So I, I think that's something that we as women, we fight with our family life and our work life balance, but you know, there has to be something where there's not a give or take or compromise. And with women, we often have to find a compromising position. You know, it's got to be win-win. It's always got to be win-win when it comes to a woman for some reason. So. And as for me, I would say my first mentors, um, one of my first mentors beside my mother, of course, was my aunt, her sister. Um, my aunt was a publicist at Universal Pictures. And I admired her um, as a little girl. Uh, she worked on Good Times, and then she went to Universal Pictures. And so I was always surrounded, again, being in LA around celebrities. Wasn't starstruck. I enjoyed, I saw, I saw what she was doing, and I enjoyed that aspect of, of publicity. And so the, I wanted to be like her. And I studied uh, UC Santa Barbara. My first job at the Walt Disney Company was as a public relations assistant. And she was the one who told me what to wear, what to wear every day, what casual Friday meant to everybody else, and what casual Friday meant to this little young African-American young lady. Basically, for all of those of you listening, my casual was not your casual, was not the casual one else. Everyone kept saying, well, you know, it's casual Friday. Like, this is my casual. <laughs> I was about to be wearing jeans, but my aunt said, you always have to be a little bit more. She talked about arriving early and not leaving the office exactly at 5.30, but you leave the office at 5.40, you leave it at 5.45, and you don't leave with an urgency. So just in case you, your boss says, oh, I need you to work on something like this. So it was my aunt, and then from there, um, I was then mentored by a woman who owned a special events company, um, because again, that's my background and it's something I ended up going from PR to event planning. And she was an African-American woman that owned her own company. And I interned for her for three years for no pay. I would work for Walt Disney Company and then I would work in her office from about 6.30 p.m. to 10 p.m. at night, almost three or four days a week and on the weekends. Mm -hmm. And I loved it. And then from there, my mentor was another African-American woman that helped to place me at DreamWorks Pictures in their um, publicity, in their special events department. But I would say more currently in venue management, um, my mentors have been, uh, have been men, have been um, someone like Bobby Goldwater, who's given me the opportunity to, to work at Georgetown University and simply meeting him at Venue Connect and saying, I have a desire to be an adjunct professor. And he said, all right, I'm bringing you on to Georgetown. And then, of course, Mike Garcia at USC with me, who I co-instruct with, you know, give, gave me the opportunity to, to do that. And then, of course, my, my mentor, Vicki, uh, who's in Atlanta, um, has always been great. But she was someone that IABM actually paired, so plug to the IABM mentorship program. It really works. And still to this day, she's still considered my mentor. Mm -hmm. Well, the questions are just coming in. I know. I think we should go ahead and start addressing some okay. of these questions. All right. Uh, I'll, I'll read the next one. So um, okay. there's an anonymous attendee who said, oftentimes when being in the workplace with one or two other women of color, either they support you or are against you. 
what advice can you give to break the ice with other women of color who see you as a threat? I'll take it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I believe that everybody has like this level of where they want to be and how they want to be perceived. And oftentimes when we do come in, you're the one woman there and you've got, you know, kind of your, your work area laid out and you know who, who's on your team, who's not on your team and everything. Anytime you have that situation, I do believe you truly need to have um, a conversation because communicating with people and talking is your, it's your key to almost everything. So invite that person to coffee and find where you have a common ground. And before you know it, y'all will be better than friends. Um, and even if you can't be friends, you'll have an understanding that, hey, I'm not a threat to you. I, I, I'm not trying to take over, you know, whatever um, you have going on here, but we can be an ally to each other. And that goes for not only um, two people of the same race, it's also people of other races or people you don't know about. Um, we often feel like, it's just me, it's me on my road by myself. But when you open yourself to be vulnerable to somebody else, to confide in somebody else about what your concerns are or what's going on in your life, you'll find often that you'll, you'll have somebody that's more of a companion and it'll be a support for you. Cynthia? I, I completely agree. I love to take out for coffee or find out what you have in common because in that situation, if I find that I'm with someone that feels that I'm a threat or something like that, I will simply say, you know what, I wasn't raised with the crabs in the barrel complex. I was not raised that way. I was raised to, to help others get to where I, I, I am. My mother was a mentor to a young lady that was in the eighth grade that was a foster student. I then became a mentor to young girls that were in foster care, African American. So when I start sharing where I'm coming from, I would hope that person would then go, oh, okay, so we can actually work together. I wanna help you and in the conversation with, what can I do to help you get to where you wanna be? And then just, and, you know, just kind of believing in karma too. I think if you put that out, it's gonna come back to you. Right. I, I would add to this, even before you ask them to have coffee, is it really they think you're a threat? Sometimes our vantage point allows us to see behavior because in our experience, this particular behavior looks like a threat when it could be uncertainty, avoidance, or nothing. Mm -hmm. So before we begin to judge or say or think what it is, let's find out what it is. Like I am all about, I'm an extreme extrovert. I'm all about invading space and I'm not apologetic about it. If we have a problem, let's get down to business. But many times I find, um, because I come into any office, any opportunity with on 10, I'm always on 10 or 20, that I don't look at the person going, they're intimidated by me, or maybe they feel like I'm a threat. I don't know. I don't have that um, uh, context. I don't build it in. I just go and meet the person. So before coffee comes, I'm actually observing them to see where our similarities are so that we can start a conversation first so they'll feel comfortable. Because sometimes when we kind of jump in and say, well, let's have a conversation and, and figure out how we can be nicey nicey, it doesn't come off authentic or integral and both people leave kind of awkward. Like, okay, that was a waste. So, but before, I, I'm all about the coffee. I'm all about, let's get to know each other. But before that, observe them and see where there's some similarities. Right, I like it. I mean, you know, I mean, simple similarities. Have you watched Lovecraft Country this weekend? You know, things like that to get the dialogue started to build in some level of comfort. Yeah. All right. Um, another one of the questions was talking about shadowing. Um, the exact question was, oh, where did it go? Sorry, uh, I put it in the answer. Oh, oh, okay. Well, um, just kind of talking about, did we ever shadow someone or have someone offer us guidance? Um, I had a great opportunity to shadow Brad Gessner, 
who used to be with the Los Angeles Convention Center. And it was actually part of a project that I was doing um, or, or cohort that I was at at USC where we were given the task to shadow someone in a, in a career that we want to aspire to, or a position that we want to aspire to, to get to. And everyone chose people that were USC employees. And because at USC, I'm pretty much the only one that does what I do. I'm, there's no one higher than me uh, on my campus that does what I do. I am the events scheduling department. Um, I reached out to Brad and he said yes. And I shadowed him for the day. And it was such an enlightening experience. It was, it was wonderful. And I connected on LinkedIn and he's retired now. I wish him all the, the things. But um, that was a great opportunity for me to see how he maneuvered um, those, those that were report to him. Uh, shadow. Is trolling a form of shadowing? Because Joyce Levingston is on here and I troll her tons. <laughs> So uh, if trolling is then equated to shadowing, then absolutely any opportunity where I find that there is a woman or a person, doesn't have to be a woman, could be a man, um, that is rocking it, that's killing it, I'm usually on their line. So Joyce, if you didn't know, I am shadowing you, um, unbeknownst to you. <laughs> And for me, there, there have been several people that have just invited me in to say, hey, let me, let me show you what I do, or I'll ask, you know, hey, do you have an hour to share with me what you go through? Um, I think it's, I've said it multiple times that Todd Hunt was um, a great executive director that I was able to go in and, you know, from when we went on IVM trips to how do I do this, then um, he's always been um, a great person to shadow and, and learn from. So I've also had that experience that has been great. All right, we have a question from Robin, Robin Williams. Um, how do you all maintain your authentic self and keep from conforming to an image that others may stereotypically expect of you? Great question, Robin. Great question. Who wants to, I'll go, I'll go. Uh, I'm me. You have to believe in you and the wow that you produce. Um, if it does not start with you, from my perspective, if you do not believe it, no one else will believe it around you. So authentically, I think one, the reason why we um, do code switching, and we talked about this, uh, code switching is sometimes necessary so that the, the person who you're speaking with can then um, understand your meaning. So it, it could be different when I'm talking to my family, I could use slang that is not sometimes not even available to my friends. They're like, oh, what does that mean? So sometimes code switching doesn't mean that you're taking away from being your authentic self or integral. However, you okay. might have- Give them the definition of code switching, just for those that don't know what that is. And so um, it's when you change so I want to give a technical definition, but I also just want this to be off the cuff. So for, it's when you kind of change your personality to fit a context, a, a different situation. 